Hi guys, Jose here from Try Me Please, and today I want to tell you why I do not use the dominance hierarchy framework when I am talking about animal behavior. I've got three main reasons for that, and I'm going to share them with you in the increasing order of importance from my point of view. Okay, reason number one. What does dominance even mean? People might have different definitions of dominance. What does someone mean when they say, one of my dogs is dominant? Or the, the dominant cat in my household? What does that mean? Starting with the Google definition here, we can see that dominance is the power and influence over others. The Cambridge Dictionary states that dominance is the quality of being more important, strong, or successful than anything else of the same type. Dictionary.com provides an interesting animal behavior definition in which it states that it is the high status in a social group, usually acquired as a result of aggression that involves the tendency to take priority in access to limited resources as food, mates, or space. Now let's have a look at some scientific papers and other respected sources of information. In this first one from 2008, they were looking at how rank can affect learning performance. And the way that they determined rank was by asking the dog owners a few questions, such as when a stranger comes to the house, which dog barks? Which dog licks more often the other dog's mouth? Which dog gets to the food first if there's only one food source? And if the dogs start to fight, which one usually wins? This one was about food competition and linear dominance, hierarchy among chimps. For this one, the researchers looked at how they approached each other and what types of vocalizations they made when they approached one another. They also looked at food monopolization, as well as association behaviors and aggressive interactions. Another study using African wild dogs looked at rank. But this one mainly used rank as a measure of whether or not reproductive suppression was happening, with the idea that high-ranking members were the ones that were actively reproducing. Another paper looked at dominance hierarchy in juvenile crayfish, and in this case, they used attack, approach, retreat, and escape as the behaviors that would tell the researchers whether or not an animal was being dominant or submissive. And finally, in this paper in which the scientists looked at a variety of species, it is mentioned that it is an attribute of the pattern of agonistic interactions between two individuals. To make things even more interesting, have a look at this sentence here on a paper from 2009. They say, in the present study of a freely interacting group of neutered male domestic dogs, pairwise relationships were evident, but no overall hierarchy could be detected. As we can see, the definition on dominance can be really tricky, can be really complicated. So whether or not we have a dominant animal or we are witnessing dominance or hierarchy or an alpha animal is really hard to be sure about. Reason number two is that animal training or behavior modification procedures based on a dominance approach can be quite dangerous. This 2009 paper found that several confrontational methods elicited an aggressive response from the dogs. The authors also say that in conclusion confrontational methods applied by dog owners before their pets were presented for a behavior consultation were associated with aggressive responses in many cases. The Association of Pet Dog Trainers states that for too many times dog owners have been given advice to show the dog who's boss and be the alpha. The unfortunate side effects of this thinking is that it creates an adversarial relationship. They also say that such misinformation damages the owner-dog relationship and may lead to fear, anxiety, and or aggressive behaviors from the dog. The Pet Professional Guild states that a dominance theory approach to animal training can damage the animal-human relationship and cause behavioral problems in the animal. They also say 
that the general pet owning public should be educated by organizations and associations on dominus theory and the many problems it can create for animals. So yes, I like to steer away from dominance based behavior modification techniques. Reason number three is that labeling an animal as dominant can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. For example, a person might say that a dog is dominant because he growls. Why does he growl? Because he's dominant. How do I know that he is dominant? Because he growls. Why does he growl? Because he's dominant. And it's a never-ending circle. That does not take me anywhere if I want to modify this dog's behavior. Every time the dog growls, it reinforces my assumption that he is dominant. And yet, I'm still not getting anywhere from an animal training point of view. A much better option, in my opinion, is to not worry whether the dog is dominant or not, and to simply describe the conditions in which the behavior happens. What happens right before the dog growls, and what happens right after the dog growls. Those environmental components are things that I can tweak and change, which might result in a different behavior. And that is a much better proposition in my opinion. You describe the behavior and you describe the immediate antecedent and the immediate consequence. In summary, you pretty much use the ABC framework to modify behavior. I've talked about the ABC framework in other videos, so in the description of this video I'll offer some other instances in which I address this topic. When we are using the ABC framework, we will look at a certain behavior and then determine the antecedent and a consequence around it. We can also make a prediction about what might happen in the future if the antecedent and consequence remain the same. This paper, published in the Journal of Applied Animal Welfare Science, states that what is important to understand is that respondent and operant conditioning principles work in dealing with dog-on-dog -dog aggression in the home, and they do so without our having to speculate about instinctive social forces and organizational structures and competitive motivations from the dog's ancestral past. The Pet Professional Guild advocates for effective animal training procedures focused on the use of behaviorism, the natural science of behavior which emphasizes natural science assumptions and avoids speculation and theoretical constructs for explaining behavior. So there you have it. Conflicting definitions, possibly dangerous and not helpful for behavior modification and animal training. That is why I do not use dominance when I am talking about animal behavior. Dominance is a label, and labels can be dangerous or can be counterproductive when we are trying to modify the behavior of the animals we live with. One thing you can do to help with labels is to either avoid them or to agree on the definition of certain labels. Full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of using negative labels such as dominant or stubborn or slow for the animals that I share my time with, but I'm a little bit more okay with positive labels such as happy, fun, engaged. I think those are less detrimental to behavior modification and animal training. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please hit that like button. And I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.